I'm Robin Amler of IBS Intelligence. You're listening to the IBS iViews podcast. With me is Paul Nilsson, Commercial Director and Managing Director of Africa, CIS and Global for Codebase Technologies. We are talking about the rising adoption of software as a service in Africa. So, Paul, what are the trends you're seeing? There's basically four sectors. The first one, obviously, being your neobanks, challenger banks that are coming in. Obviously, Africa has seen some of the successes of um, the Revoluts, the Tinkoffs. You know, everybody's expecting big things from Zand because they're looking outside of pure retail and going also into the corporate side. So a lot of interest on the African continent around that. A lot of people in most countries in Africa, you have these neobanks that have started applying to the reserve banks for licenses. Unfortunately, these are taking some time, but they're out there, they're talking, they're getting these licenses, they're coming to us and saying, how can we help? They're not interested in infrastructure. They're not interested in, the, in, in running the software. They want to outsource all of that. They just want to focus on their business. So neobanks, challenger banks, a big one. The next one, your fintech disruptors, people taking advantage of bringing in lending schemes, which is huge since it's always been big in Africa. But since COVID, I think it's been even more of a requirement for individuals. So a lot of disruptors bringing that in. Remittances, international remittances or across the continent um, is another big one. Then, of course, you've got all those organizations or entities trying to drive financial inclusion, trying to find a true economy of scale, multi-entity SaaS deployment, where you can get these rural entities that don't have access to the technology on board, and then obviously provide it in such a way that the, the person you're trying to financially include is not feeling the pinch, but being able to come into the financial sector and start transacting, which is your first step to move them out of poverty. And then finally, the fourth one is your legacy banks that have now seen, and and I think this is very much the same as the mobile network operator boom that we experienced in Africa some 15 years ago, where the, the banks were going to the central banks and saying, oh, you've got to help us. You've got to stop these guys coming into the market because they're stealing our business. Nothing happened because the central banks enjoyed the way they were including and banking more people. I say that in inverted commas. So now the banks through COVID have seen branch banking is not that great. I definitely need to make the next step moving into a digital arm of my bank. So a lot of the calls that we're getting now are from legacy banks saying, can you help us the way you've helped your other customers in opening up a digital arm of our bank so that we can start grabbing that market and not potentially going to lose more market share as your neobanks and other players start coming into the market. So those are the trends we're seeing across Africa, a lot of excitement and yeah, great time for us. It sounds almost from what you're saying that there's a completely blank sheet of paper in front of you and the market opportunities are huge. Pretty much in every single sector, whether it's financial or non-financial, we've got a lot of telcos now approaching us as well and saying, we've always been in the transaction side of the business, but can we expand our offering to maybe promote financial inclusion through corporate social responsibility programs, et cetera, et cetera, because Africa is so beautiful. I say beautiful in an aspect of being unbanked for organizations that want to get involved in trying to bank those people. A lot of the big players sway away from it because it comes at a cost. It comes at a huge investment to code-based technology as well as the infrastructure partners that we sign on. But it's not money you're going to make now. You've got to have a plan in place to be able to have a return on investment over the next three to five years where you can then start gaining market share and access to all these people. So it is pretty much a blank sheet of paper. You can draw your roadmap you can basically decide how you're going to move in the industry and where you're going to focus on. As I say, financial and non-financial all want to grow in the space, especially in, um, from a financial sector point of view. And in many cases, it's also bringing a lot of people that have been playing in the mobile network space back into the financial sector. So exciting times for the continent. Is the infrastructure actually robust enough to be able to cope? 
Yes, I think, it, and in that case, the mobile network operators have done us a huge favor over the last 15 years. So you've got the likes of these mobile network operators across the continent that have rolled out Wi-Fi. A lot of them have gone into the fiber as well, the LTE. So they've made these communications a lot easier. From a financial perspective, from a, from a banking perspective, they have made life a lot easier for anybody deploying SaaS to be able to reach the most rural microfinance or SACO in the bush. Because if those people have got a mobile phone, they can now start banking. So the communication infrastructure has been assisted. That infrastructure has been assisted by the Celcos and the Telcos. And then, of course, we see big drives from Oracle, Google, Microsoft, AWS, all these guys coming into niche markets. Obviously, they're taking the top technology sectors, uh, sectors within the continent, being Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, and that. And they're focusing deploying cloud there, and then they're moving. It'll, it'll eventually go across the continent, but wherever there is cloud, we're taking full advantage of that and deploying our technology in the continent on the cloud and making it available. So, yes, again, you know, from an infrastructure perspective, banks don't need to worry about that anymore. Previously, the IT departments have been controlling the bank and their growth. And I think those days are slowly but surely coming to an end. There's no need to spend millions of dollars on your IT infrastructure when you can outsource it and actually start focusing on your actual business as a bank. Well, I was about to say that. It does mean that a bank has a great weight lifted off its shoulders in terms of managing technology and can focus on delivering its business to its customers. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and we're seeing that a lot of the business people within the banks are now starting to stand up and saying, but wait a minute, you know, especially when it comes to a discussion of going in or moving into the digital realm. So I don't have to rip and replace my core banking system. All I have to do is open up a digital arm, which is the front end on top of my existing infrastructure and run that. And it can also come from the, uh, from the cloud. It can be locally hosted in a data center. So you can actually localize your deployments when it comes to regulatory issues in certain countries. You can actually now have a wider choice of saying, how do I actually want to approach this and who I'm going to use as my SaaS partner? You mentioned regulatory issues. You also mentioned earlier on how central banks actually welcomed uh, telco activity in the finance sector a few years ago. Are there any regulatory issues that need to be, we need to be concerned about? Are there significant differences country to country? There are big differences country to country. If you look at some, uh, uh, an area like Zimbabwe, obviously the central bank understands that they have to relax their data sovereignty issues. But generally speaking, if you look across the continent, data sovereignty is still a massive aspect in Africa. So that means any organization wanting a core banking system which carries your customer and your transactional data, that system has to sit in country. So when you go to a place like Nigeria or Kenya or South Africa, there's no problem because you can deploy it on, on any cloud that's available in that country and it still is in country. But in any other country that we're partnering with our partners now from an infrastructure perspective, we go with guys that have already got locally hosted data centers and we can actually deploy it there to adhere to these data sovereignty laws. Again, the central banks in many cases are relaxing them where they can see the infrastructure is not good enough and they need to allow their banks to grow and allow them to thus get SaaS from outside because it's more affordable. They can make more money, more foreign investment. And then we're also seeing that the central banks are starting to regulate the smaller guys as well. So now you go into some countries in Africa where the central bank is saying, but hold it, hold on a minute a lot of the money floating around is floating within these smaller organizations. Take the SACOs of Kenya or take the MFIs of any other country where a lot of the money sits because traditionally I'm going to have an account where I was born or where I come from and I'm going to have an account in the urban areas. So the smaller rural entities 
have a lot of cash available because they've got a, they, they naturally have accounts growing all the time. And the regulators are saying, I need to start regulating you. But if I start regulating you, you need to adhere to data sovereignty laws, which in turn is going to mean you need to bring your cause within the, uh, within the country. That means if you are currently on a SAS, you need to now get a localized SAS. So there are those things that people need to consider and need to understand when coming into the African market. And that's why Codebase is committed to investing in specific countries to actually take the SAS into the country and allow everybody within those countries to enjoy the, the economies of scale and be able to grow in uh, financially and un bank the unbanked. Well, I was going to ask you uh, to go into detail about the localization of solutions, but I think you kind of covered that in the answer you've just given. So let me press fast forward. You've talked about this huge opportunity. What does the shape of the market look like in five years' time? What do you think the evolution of SaaS is going to show us in the marketplaces in Africa? I think you're going to find that the percentage of banks or financial institutions as a whole that are deployed on SaaS is going to be so much larger. I don't think in five years' time you'll have a lot of your big fives in each country. So your, your larger banks, I don't think within five years they'll be able to turn the ship because their ships turn so slowly. I think they will definitely deploy certain modules and um, applications that they bring in now, the newer additions, they will start deploying on SaaS. But to change their entire system onto SaaS, I think is probably going to take a bit longer than that. I would hope that they keep an eye out. So they look outside the box because a lot of your smaller entities, your, your microfinance entities, your SACOs, your credit unions, a lot of those guys don't have to start back where the, the big bank started. They can jump immediately onto SaaS. And with that, my hope is that the larger entities start moving a lot quicker into that realm and start focusing on the true business where it is. And that is digital, remaining relevant with your customer and your customer re remaining relevant with you. Because that's the only way banking is working in the future. If we look at it from a generation perspective, the new customers coming on board now, your 25-year-olds are Gen Zs. So your Gen Zs, at the, I think this year, are sitting between seven years old and, and 25 years old. Those are your new customers. Those are the people coming out of varsity, getting a job, wanting a bank account. Those people have got eight seconds attention span, according to some of the studies that have been put out. If the big banks are not steering their ship fast enough into the digital realm, they're going to lose a lot of the new customers. Paul Nelson of Codebase Technologies, thank you very much.